My sheet here used the same assumptions found in Anthony Sanders' example that is assigned to FRM candidates, where the point is to illustrate the exposure of a bank to foreign currency risk when its balance sheet is not hedged. And that risk arises when the source of funds, in this case, are entirely in U.S. dollars, yet the assets, in this case, some of the loans, are made abroad and are invested in a foreign currency. My example here has the same assumptions that are found in Anthony Sanders example 13-1 and the point of this exercise is to illustrate this bank's exposure to foreign exchange or foreign currency risk specifically if it has an unhedged balance sheet so that means a balance sheet that is not hedged with respect to its foreign exchange or foreign currency exposure so we do this with a simplistic balance sheet assets on the left liabilities on the right liabilities of the source of funding so in this for this bank there's only one line this bank is funded 200 million dollars this bank is based in the US or domiciled in the US and it's paying its it's paying its depositors or whoever it's borrowing from uh, an interest rate of 8% these are the cost of funds what is it doing with the 200 million dollars that are the source of funds it's investing those in assets, or in this case, making loans. It's dividing it into two pieces, half and half. 100 million is staying at home, so to speak, in the U.S., and is extended as loans to U.S. customers, where you can see, again, I'm using Saunders' assumption, those loans are earning a rate of 9%. These are gross returns, and there is no assumption in this. There is no modeling here about defaults. So, we have a gross spread you can see here of 1%. Bank borrows at 8, makes loans at 9, has a spread of 1%. However, the other half of the 200 million source of funds is goes abroad, specifically the United Kingdom or Great Britain. I'll use them synonym, synonymously. So the 100 million US dollars is invested abroad and it's going those loans are going to earn 15% in the United Kingdom. And then Sanders shows well, what is the effect of foreign currency or a, a change in the spot foreign exchange rate? And we start here at $1.60. Now, uh, so I'm, again, following his assumptions, so it's not today's exchange rate. I think the spot exchange rate is more like uh, 1.3. And then a brief note about notation, because we know this is always very confusing to new learners. The this is the this is expressed the way conventionally we would express it, and that is to say, we would put I'm going to use the tickers here, uh, British pounds slash U.S. dollars, and we could take the slash out. I often do when I write questions for these. I often take the slash out, but we would typically do it this way. That is to say, put the British pounds first in the currency pair and put the U.S. dollars second in the currency pair. Here's the important part. The first currency in the pair is the base currency. The second currency is the quote currency. So this dollar sixty, you may have noticed, has a dollar sign, not a does not have the British pound symbol. Okay, that's deliberate because that's consistent here with the US dollar being the quote currency. Right? This is 1.60 US dollars as the quote per 1.0 British pound sterlings as the base. And of course we could take the reciprocal of that, switch these around, and then we would have the US dollar as the base, British pound as the quote. However, by convention, there's a priori priority ranking as I mentioned, and the British pound is above the US dollars. So this is typically the way we should quote this. Um, although mathematically, the reciprocal is the same. So for Anthony Sanders here in his example, we start the year or this bank starts the year with a spot exchange rate of $1.6. And then you'll notice in the baseline assumption, it does not change. So we're not introducing in here any disruption on the an exchange rate. And what I have down here is I just modeled that loan that goes abroad uh, to the United Kingdom. And so that's 100 million in US dollars right here. And then 
at the beginning of the year, when it goes up abroad to the United Kingdom, right, it gets translated into 62.5 British pounds, right? You can see all I did was divide by the exchange rate. And so that's at the beginning of the year, US dollars converts to British pounds. And then now, now I'm going vertically to represent the time dimension. The 62.5 British pounds grows at 15%. You can see how straightforward that is. Just multiply by 1.15. Grows, perform, performs as expected per the loan to 71.88 British pounds sterlings. Maybe I should say British, British pounds at the end of the year, but these are British pounds. And so now these, these come back home, so to speak, repatriated, so to speak, um, simply by multiplying by the exchange rate in, at the end of the year. It happens to be the same, see? So 71.88 British pound sterlings comes back home to 115 US dollars. If the, if the exchange rate didn't change in the meantime, didn't fluctuate, so the 100 million that was half of the 200 that was invested abroad grows by 15%. Hopefully that's as you would expect, right? We expect a 15% return. There wasn't any noise introduced by the foreign but the uh, by the uh, foreign exchange rate. So that's the 15% on half of it and then now for the summary calculations, right? The return on assets is simply for the whole portfolio. It was split in half in US dollars, so the 12%, see, also you can see it's really uh, weighted in terms of the values, but half and half in this case is, is halfway between 15 and nine. So this portfolio return on assets was 12%. The cost of funds here is 8%, very simple, a one lump on the same lump sum, it's really the same as the assumption. The difference then is the return on investment. I'm not going to quibble with the language that Sanders use here. So ROA minus cost of funds is 4% ROI. The bank is positive. Um, in, in part, it, because both sides of the loan, the U.S. side contributes a 1% spread, but the uh, loans made abroad actually contribute a 6% spread. Okay. I've also done it in dollar terms down here. You can see the return on the U.S. loan is 9 million. That's 9% 9 on 100. The return on the U.K. loan is 15 million U.S. dollars. Total interest earned then is the sum of the two. Cost of funds is 16 million. That's 8% of the 200. And then we have the ROI is simply the difference between the two, 8 million divided by the 200 million base. Okay, so that's the baseline and everything looks pretty good. And then Sanders just compares that to the whole point of this was to now introduce the risk scenario. So what is the risk here? If we think about it for a second, are we going to increase or decrease the value? Well, if we're the bank in the U.S. making these loans abroad to the United Kingdom, then if you think about it, our risk is that there's a depreciation in that foreign currency in the British pound sterling. So in terms of the currency pair, remember we said the base here is the British pound and the uh, quote is the US dollars. So the foreign exchange risk is this 100 million that goes abroad. It's the risk that the British pound depreciates and in terms of the currency pair, that's equivalent to the U.S. dollar appreciating either way. And we would represent that, therefore, with by dropping this number. And Sanders does that dramatically to $1.45. And now we see the effect of that. The effect, of course, there's no effect in terms of the borrowing or in terms of the $100 million that goes to the U.S. However... And there's also no, no effect at the beginning of the year where the hundred, the half goes abroad, becomes 62.5 pound sterlings. Also no effect here. The 62.5 grows to the end of the year to that same 71.88 British pound sterlings at the end of the year. Now comes the difference. Now we bring it back to the U.S. 
and we're bringing it back, the multiplier is not 1.6 anymore, it's 1.45 because the British pound depreciated, or put another way, the US dollar appreciated with respect to the British pound. So it comes back as only 104 million. 0.22, which is only 4.22%. So now ROA on the portfolio was the average of that 4.22 and the 9%, which is 6.61. And it's less than the cost of funds. The ROI is now negative. That's the point of the exercise to illustrate what happens to this bank's balance sheet when it's unhedged. And I have it also here in uh, just in dollar terms. So you can see here's the return on the U.S. loan, same $9 million, but now I've explicitly factored the uh, appreciation effect, positive if it's appreciation of the pound, uh, negative if, if it's depreciation in the pound. So you can see I just divide the uh, $1.45 by $1.60 minus one simple return. In this case, it's a negative. So we have a negative 9.38 depreciation in the British pound as the base currency is illustrated by these assumptions. And then to get the dollar here, the, the dollar return, what I'm doing here now is, see I take 1.15, so the 15%, multiply it by the appreciation on the British pound. Those multiplied together, if I subtract one, gives me the net return when I factor in the change in the uh, uh, spot exchange rate. And so I get, and, and then and multiplied by the 100 million gives me the uh, 4.22 million. So that I can add those together, get the interest earned on both halves of the portfolio then is 13.22 million. My cost of funds is unchanged and my ROI calculation is the same. Now is negative 1.39 and it matches. So that's just the alternative presentation. But that's the point in the unhedged balance sheet. This bank is funded entirely in U.S. dollars. It would be naturally hedged if all of its loans stayed in U.S. dollars. But in this case, half of the portfolio goes out in Britain, abroad to the U.K., where it is exposed to depreciation in that foreign currency, which will come back and adversely affect the bank, in this case, make it unprofitable from an ROI perspective. So I hope that's helpful. If it is helpful, um, subscribe to the channel. Thank you.